25 to 5 on a Friday afternoon, and that means it's time to talk money, and who better to do that than Luke Smith from Envision Financial. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I tell you what, you boy can pick the cheerful topics. What happens to my super <laughs> when I die? And is it tax? So not only are we talking about people dying, we're also paying tax as a result. Well, I mean, how much more depressing does it get? Well, it's past the rise of blood on a Friday afternoon, right? But no, look, this one, this one has come up more and more leading into the election. Yeah. Because everybody kept coming in saying, oh, there's going to be death tax, estate tax, gift tax, this tax, that tax. And I said, well, there sort of is. And people sort of perk up and go, well, what do you mean? I said, well, your super's taxed depending on where it goes. And people look at you with this sort of dumbfounded, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And here's how it works. And you can see them go, well, that is a tax. I said, yeah, so we don't need another one. So I thought we might as well talk about it because there are some also some strategies we can use that have become very beneficial with the removal of the work test from that one July that we week, spoke yeah. about last week. So Yeah, yeah. well, here, here we are. They say that the only two certainties in life are death and taxes, and here we are today talking mm. about both of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I suppose we'll start at the beginning. <clears throat> what happens to my super when I shuffle off this mortal coil. Yeah, so the first the first answer is it depends. <laughs> um, but if we're thinking about superannuation, let's say I have a superannuation fund and I'm adding to it because I'm working, I die, and inside my superannuation fund, I may have or should have a binding death nomination. And that is an election that goes to the super fund trustee that says, in the event that I die, this is what I want to happen because your will has no power over your super. And yeah. we've, we've touched on that in the past. Now, if I'm in pension phase, I may have a reversionary pension. So let's say I'm 60 and I'm taking a pension out of my super and I die. My wife may be the reversionary pensioner. And in that instance, it carries on to her, doesn't form part of the estate and just continues to pay out as it was as if it was mine. Right. The important thing we need to keep in mind here is where the money lands determines how it's taxed and the components or the makeup of your super determines if there is tax to pay or not. So let's, let's separate those two. Under the legislation, a child that is dependent and a spouse receive money on a tax-free basis. Okay. So we can make the general assumption that if a husband or wife dies, if the money goes to the spouse, it's tax free. Great. But let's say you both get hit by the same bus. And yeah, you are cheerful today, aren't you? <laughs> I'd say a plane going down, but I'm gonna get on one tomorrow, so let's stick with a bus. Um, if, if the money gets paid to a non-dependent child, it's taxed at 17% on the taxable component of your super. Okay, so general rule. Spouses and dependent kids, tax free. Pay to a non-dependent, over the age of 18 not studying, 17% tax. Insurance proceeds, pay to a non-dependent, 32% tax. So you need to be thinking, where do I hold my insurance and who is it going to, or grossing up the tax that you'll incur. So if we know that bit, yeah. We then turn around and say, well, what is a taxable component of super? Which was the question you were probably just about to ask me. Well, I was going to say, it didn't take long to start getting complicated. Well, because yeah. we start from the basis, okay, uh, it may be taxed or it may not be taxed, depending on who receives the money. But then it becomes a bit more complicated. It might be taxed at this rate or it might be taxed at that rate. And now we're going to Correct. go to another level of complexity about whether it's deductible or non-deductible source contributions. Exactly right, exactly right. So for everybody listening, think about your super like this. If your work or you have put money into super where a deduction has been claimed, so that could include superannuation guarantee payments from your employer, salary sacrifice during the year, growth on your investments and personal deductible contributions, they form a taxable portion of your super. Let's say you put $300,000 into your super because you sold your home. That goes in as a tax-free contribution and maintains tax-free status. 
So let's look at the example of uh, $100,000. We've got $100,000 taxable, $100,000 tax free. There's $200,000 in our fund. If I die and it goes to an adult child, then you would pay 17% tax or $17,000 on that taxable portion, which is 50%. That's that $100,000. And the tax free money that you put in maintains its tax free status in the future. That would go out to a non dependent tax free. So if we keep it nice and simple, <laughs> where is the money going? Is the person a dependent? Spouse and minor children, yes. Adult children, no. Then of the money that's getting paid out, is there a taxable component? Or is there a tax-free component? Because money is taken out of super on a percentage basis. So this would be the same if you were taking out a lump sum of $10,000. Half of it would be taxable, half of it would be tax-free, depending on the percentage makeup of your super fund. So it's a bit like the iceberg under the water. All of this is going on inside your fund, and you're looking at the pointy end of the iceberg saying, I have a million dollars, but it has different components under that. Now, the other layer of complexity that occurs <clears throat> to me is that if I die while I'm still working and I haven't started drawing a pension yet, is that a different circumstance to what happens if I die after I've retired and I've started drawing a pension from my superannuation fund? Not necessarily. So all of those same rules apply in relation to where's it gonna go. The, the difference there may be, do you have a reversionary pensioner? If you don't, then the benefits would be paid out as a lump sum and then exactly the same process would be applied. Where's it going? What are the components? And who's gonna pay the tax when it lands in their account? So it's really important that your estate planning documentation and your wishes align with your superannuation fund and the binding nomination or the pension reversionary setup that may be there to try and get the water to run downhill or the money to run downhill to the, to the, to the buckets that you want it to land in. So this isn't something that you do in isolation. This is something that you need to think about you know, in conjunction with your, your will um, because you do have the ability to make a nomination to your estate get the money into the estate and then the will takes over and says, right, where do we disperse it? But again, where's the money come from? Where has the money landed? And what are the tax implications for the person that's receiving it? And this is where the taxable tax-free components become a, a massive issue. And the, as I said earlier, the removal of the work test is fantastic because if you don't have to meet a work test up to the age of 75, you can do some black magic if you like and work on a withdrawal and recontribution strategy to reduce the taxable percentage of your super fund and increase the tax free portion of your super fund therefore avoiding that 17 percent tax because at 75 your kids may longer be minors they might be <laughs> well no not likely but they're probably not going to be mm -hmm. exactly um and you can you can you can be proactive and then avoid this tax unnecessarily um, so that removal of the work test is a fantastic piece of legislation that will let people now start to look at this. Because it, in the past, if you were over 67 and you didn't meet the work test, you couldn't do anything about your taxable components because you couldn't put money into super. Now you can. We need to start thinking next level and you know a few bends down the road. Now I'm going to say something that's going to be uh, something that you think is blindingly obvious, but I would assume that it's probably a good idea that you make sure that you dot all your I's and cross all your T's before you die. Oh, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Like this, this is really, and, and we see this a lot where people come to us, and I had one just last week. You've got a binding nomination, here's all my paperwork. And then I said, you have, do you have a binding nomination in place? Yes, it goes to each other, it's all there. When you actually went through it, they hadn't witnessed it. So they'd made the nomination but it was invalid because there weren't two witnesses to the signatures to make the nomination so. So it was actually, there was nothing in place. And then it all gets murky and, and, and just, it, it's, it's angst at a horrible time you don't need. So this is where having your estate planning in place and your binding nominations in place or an understanding of how the money will come out of your super fund can be vital because if there are minor children involved, there's another level of complexity that a good family lawyer can then bring to the table to avoid unnecessary tax money coming out of the estate. Um, so again, I, I stress to people, 
don't assume this is simple. Don't assume that uh, I will from the post office is gonna get it done. Get some advice about this because it is generally one of your largest assets outside of your house and understanding how it's distributed to mitigate all of the tax considerations that we just touched on can be very, very powerful for that next generation. Yeah, so there's a number of different things to consider. Obviously, in your estate planning, the, the step number one is drawing up your will. But then, of course, on top of that is making sure that all of the directions in your super fund are in place because your mm. will doesn't cover that. Correct. Spot on. And on top of that, of course, the other things that you need to attend to, like enduring powers of attorney and advanced health directives and things of that nature. You need to make sure you do all of them. If mm. you leave any pieces of the puzzle out, things could mm. run off the rails. Oh, 100%. And this is where, you know, I stress to people, have you got an enduring power of attorney well no I don't so if you trip over in the shower smash your head and don't know who you are and, and lose capacity nobody can take the money out of super for you now you've got to fight with super valuation trustees that don't know you from a bar of soap they're following the law everybody else is trying to get something done you need some ramps at home you need some money for medical help if you don't have something like an enduring power of attorney it sounds like a you know a, a simple document and to get one done is relatively simple um, you need a trained professional to do it, but I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Um, so this as part of your super planning is, you know, think about where is it gonna go? Think about how is it gonna be taxed? What are my taxable components? And you can get that from your annual statement. So you generally get an annual statement in July from your fund, and it will give you a breakdown of the balance at 30 June, the makeup of your investments, the percentage of your um, individual asset weightings or your asset allocation and then on one of those pages it will have a, a breakdown of taxable and tax free and this is the same for PSS for example for the defined benefit schemes you have a tax free component which is your 10% contribution and then you have an employer component so all funds have these different components and like when the money is paid out in a similar vein it'll affect the taxable nature of a defined benefit income stream. So understanding the taxable and tax-free components, it isn't difficult, but it's very important. I want people to be aware of the potential tax liability that they may have not known about. Because a lot of people say, well, I'm over 60, it's tax-free to me. Yes, to you it is, but not to potentially somebody that's receiving it from you and from your super. So obviously there's a, a lot to consider. What are the key points that people need to keep in mind here, do you think? I think understand where your money's going to land. And remember that it may not go to a spouse. Check your taxable components. Check your tax-free components. And if you are over 67, remember that from the 1st of July, you will be able to actively improve the percentage makeup of your fund in relation to the proportion of taxable components and tax-free components. I think you also need to keep this in mind when making contributions. So let's look at this one. Let's say I've got a super fund and I've used that for my entire working life of 40 years and the vast majority of that fund is made up of employer contributions. I may have put a few in through salary sacrifice as well, so a very large proportion of that fund will be a taxable component. If you inherited some money, you had a downsizer contribution, you'd sold an investment property and you wanted to bolster your superannuation before you started a pension, you'd be wise to consider opening another account because if you put that $300,000 into another account, that's 100% tax-free. Start a pension with that and that's tax-free forever. Now that could grow from $300,000 to a million dollars. Then there's a million dollars of tax-free component that can be paid out to non-dependent children with no tax liability. So I need to get people thinking next level. This is no longer amateur hour, oh, we just do this and have one fund and throw it all in because you could be muddying up the water with your taxable and tax-free components and therefore having a direct impact on the tax on your super when it leaves your fund. I'm with Luke Smith from Envision Financial and we're talking about what happens to your super if you die and how is it taxed and as you might have noticed, it is a little bit complicated. It's about 11 to 5. We'll be back to summarise it all in just a moment. It's about 
at seven minutes to five on two double C to Friday afternoon. So we're talking finance this afternoon with Luke Smith from Envision Financial. Now strap yourself in because today we're talking about what happens to my super when I die and is it taxed? Luke, you do pick a cheerful topic, but you know we've covered it all in pretty substantial detail. Now, mm. what are the key things to remember? So if I was going to look at my statement in July, I'd be checking the taxable and tax-free components of my super because they are the drivers that will determine the tax that will be paid to a non-dependent. Keep in mind that money to a spouse and money to minors, tax-free, no problems. So it's always advantageous to think about nominating your spouse as the beneficiary potentially, because it's going to ensure that money passes without incurring a liability. If you've got insurance through superannuation, think about who the beneficiaries are and where it is intended to go. Because if it goes to a non-dependent child, you're gonna lose 32%. So that's 320,000 on a million. Now, if you'd held it outside of super, you would have passed on that full million. Or gross it up, add that tax that you'll incur, maintain 130, well, 1.32 million, and then they'll get a net million if that's what you're trying to achieve. So understand, again, with your why, start there and come backwards. Why am I taking out? Why am I holding it in super? Why am I holding it outside of super? One of those key things is to control the tax for all the reasons that we've spoken about today. Check you've got a binding nomination in place. If you don't, then it could be at the discretion of the trustee where your money's paid, that could have adverse tax implications. If you're gonna pay money to minors, you can nominate them, but make sure, again, as you said, your paperwork is in place, and also ensure that if you have broader wishes and objectives, that the binding nomination and your estate planning are held in conjunction with each other to get the outcome that you're after because your will has no power over your super. And if you do have a large portion of taxable component in your super and you're gonna put some large lump sums in, consider opening another fund and increasing the tax-free component on one side whilst withdrawing and recontributing using that removal of the work test for people over 67 from the 1st of July. So you can all actively improve your position. It's just being aware that it's an issue and then being able to do something about it. And the removal of that work test will give you the window up to age 75 to do that. So keep that in mind, you'll save a fortune and your kids will thank you when you're no longer around. Yeah, for me, the, the number one key point out of all of this is just don't forget that you need to nominate your beneficiary with your superannuation fund because your will yes. does not control your super. Yes. The two things are totally separate. Correct. Doesn't matter what you put in your will, the super is a totally separate thing. Yeah, spot on. And the other thing I'd stress, completely off topic, an enduring power of attorney yeah. is not a document for old people, <laughs> right? It's everyone comes in, I've got it for my mum, have you got one? No. So if super's in your name and you want someone to act in your best wishes or your best intentions, ensure you have an enduring power of attorney and get the outcome you're after. Indeed. So, look, it's that time of the day when I say, where can listeners get more information? Right, so 6260 4749. I think we've got some spots in uh, in September, October free. Um, www.envisionfinancial.com.au. We've got the podcast, The Strategy Stacker. Luke talks money on iTunes and Spotify. And we've got YouTube. We've got Envision Financial Canberra on YouTube. You can subscribe to the channel, get the shows. We record them all. You don't have to read anything. You can watch them on your phone, pause it, get the takeouts, and there's a little bit there for everybody. Fantastic stuff. Thanks very much, and we'll catch you again next Friday. See you next week.